In past episodes, we learned of Don Bosco's vision of the future of his Salesians in South America, but how did he ever populate those countries with enough priests? He was able to tell who had a vocation through his God-given grace of discernment of spirits, his ability to read the hearts of men. The Miracles and Prophecies of St. John Bosco, a project of America Needs Fatima. I'm your host, Matthew Miller. Subscribe for new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. It was usual for Don Bosco to read into the human heart, as is shown by the following story told by his Salesians. Don Bosco had been absent for many days. The first evening after his arrival, he gave us the usual good night talk. He was greeted by a long round of applause, and it took him some time to reach the stand. When he finally mounted it, a deeply moving silence fell over all. I've been away a long time, haven't I? He smilingly remarked. But what else could I do? You eat so much bread that Don Bosco has to run out to find money to pay for it. But during my absence... I came back twice. We looked at one another with eyes wide open in astonishment and pricked up our ears. I truly did, he went on. On one of these visits, I came into the church during high mass and noticed that one of you was missing. Tomorrow that boy will pack his bags and go home because Don Bosco doesn't want such boys. Bear it well in mind, my sons. Even from afar, Don Bosco always sees you. Now we felt more moved than surprised. As he stepped down from the stand, we crowded around him, clamoring, Who is it? Who is it? I won't tell you, he gravely replied. The one concerned will know tomorrow. The next day we found out that one of our schoolmates had gone home. Even from afar, Don Bosco always sees you. Another pupil, Joseph Gumba, who later became a Salesian priest and provincial in Uruguay, entered the oratory in the summer of 1872. On his very first confession to Don Bosco, the latter asked, Will you have confidence in me? Yes, father. Well then, I'll question you, and you must answer truthfully. Yes, father. You did this, didn't you? Yes, father. You didn't do that, did you? No, father. All his questions perfectly matched what the youngster had or had not done so that the confession, which the lad had begun in a state of mental confusion, and with the fear of unwittingly leaving something out, ended with the certainty of having revealed everything and with a most enviable peace of mind, which henceforth was never disturbed. Realizing that Don Bosco had read his heart like an open book, Gamba not only never changed confessors during his stay at the oratory, for he was sure that he could never find a better one, but he also tried not to commit any faults, because he didn't cherish the thought of Don Bosco telling him about them. Father Louis Nye, a Salesian missionary priest who was appointed provincial of Santiago, Chile, felt compelled to write about an experience of his own. One evening in 1872, I believe it was the last day of the student's spiritual retreat, Don Bosco was hearing confessions behind the main altar. I was one of the last penitents. When I was through with my confession, Don Bosco said these precise words to me. At this moment, your whole future is wide open to me. He then went on to tell me what he saw. I recall experiencing then and there a heavenly joy. Now I can swear under oath that everything Don Bosco told me did come true. Don Bosco told Louis, I see a bear and a lion attacking you. They symbolize the trials which you will be exposed to moral struggles, and calumnies. But I can also see your goodwill. Don't be upset. Keep going. The youth later confirmed under oath that he had indeed encountered these trials and overcome them. In regard to calumny, a companion threatened to accuse him falsely to Don Bosco and indeed carried out his threat. Hearing of this, Nye hastened to Don Bosco to defend himself, but the priest forestalled him, saying, Don't you trust me? Have no fear, I know you well. On another occasion, after Nye had finished his confession, Don Bosco asked him, Would you like to make a deal with me? What kind? Figure it out, I'll tell you about it some other time. The boy waited anxiously for the day of his weekly confession in order to have the riddle explained. When it finally came, he immediately asked Don Bosco, So what's the deal? Go to Father Rua, Don Bosco replied. More curious than ever, the lad complied. 
Don Bosco sent me to you, he told Father Rua. What for? About some deal he wants to make with me. Father Rua stopped to think for a moment. Oh, yes, he replied. Come tomorrow to the conference in the church of St. Francis de Sales. The conference was for Salesians. He attended and began to understand. When he was a Salesian priest, he once asked Don Bosco, What particularly prompted you to tell me that you wanted to make a deal with me when I was a young student? While I was hearing confessions, Don Bosco replied, I often saw little tongues of fire detach themselves from the candles on the altar of Mary Help of Christians and, after moving in circles, flutter over the heads of some boys. One of those tongues of fire settled over you. For him, those flames were obvious signs that those boys were to join the Salesian Society. This happened many times, as he himself confided to his Salesian priests in 1885. Another zealous missionary, Father Maggioriano Boratello, left us an interesting account of his first meeting with Don Bosco. The lad entered the Salesian school of Varese in 1873 with no intention whatsoever of becoming a priest, still less a religious, and particularly a Salesian, because he had misgivings about Don Bosco and his work. Shortly after his arrival at the school, he wasn't too happy to hear that Don Bosco was coming for a visit. His report is as follows. I was looking forward to seeing Don Bosco, but at the same time I felt uneasy about being seen by him. When he arrived, all the pupils ran elatedly to him, vying with one another to kiss his hand, while he smiled and greeted them most amiably. I, too, approached him from the rear, unseen, and kissed his hand just to be able to say afterward that I, too, had done it. He pretended not to see me by turning his head away from me, but he gripped one of my fingers and held it tightly, together with the fingers of some ten or more other boys, so that I was obliged to follow him through the long corridor. As he went along, he gradually let go of the other boys, so that by the time he reached the wide staircase, there were only two of us with him. John Bielli, a close friend and classmate of mine, now a priest, and myself. After chatting a while with Bielli, Don Bosco dismissed him. He then turned to me. Until now, he hadn't looked at me at all, seemingly on purpose. Immediately, I thought to myself, oh, now I'm in for it. How will I do? Don Bosco gave me a piercing look that shook my every fiber. Unable to sustain his scrutiny, I lowered my eyes in embarrassment and awe. I realized and am still convinced that he was seeing into my very soul, not only what I was then, but what I might become with God's grace and his help. Never in my life had I experienced anything of this sort. Very amiably, he asked my name, what I planned to do in the future, whether I liked the school, and so on. He ended by saying, remember, I want to be your friend. Dismissing me, he added, Tomorrow I'll be hearing confessions in the sacristy. Come and see me. We shall have a nice talk and you'll be happy. It's easier to imagine than to describe my feelings after this encounter. I was glad to have made his acquaintance. Then and there I felt that I loved him, and all my misgivings instantly disappeared. I made my confession to him the following day, and just as he had promised, I was deeply satisfied. He himself laid bare the state of my conscience so precisely, but ever so gently, that I was astonished and confused, wondering what was more admirable in him, his saintliness in reading my soul, or his kindness and tact in telling me what he saw. I wept with sheer joy at having found such a dear friend and father, and ever after, my love for him increased with no abatement. Whenever I could, I went to confession to him, and was always highly satisfied. At times, he gave me advice which had nothing to do with my confession, but after a few moments' reflection, I would realize that he was right. Only one who could read into the innermost recesses of a conscience could have spoken as he did. He also predicted several things to me which were fulfilled to the letter. If you'd like to hear a dream of St. John Bosco in which he cautions us against grumbling and disobedience, just click on the link above me here. God bless you, and Our Lady keep you.